What's up, guys? It's Casey Zogelman, a.k.a. the Fort Sanderson Sister, coming at you with another Hocus Pocus 3 speculation video. In today's video, I'm going to discuss something we have zero clue about right now. What the plot of the third movie will be. Now, I have talked about previously and endlessly about how I personally think a third movie should go for consistency in the story. And you can watch that pitch by clicking on this thing right here if you haven't. In that one, I have the Sanders and Sisters remaining as a unit and pulling the wool over our eyes for most of the film right up to the end. Today I've got a new pitch for you guys that would see the trio breaking apart. That's right, I'm splitting the party, so let's dive in. First off, let's be optimistic and say we can get a PG-13 rating for this movie. Just, just, just think optimistically for just a few minutes and bear with me because it would be worth the PG-13 rating, I assure you. The premise is going to remain loosely the same, bringing back Max, Allison, Danny, and the new kids on the block, Beckett, Izzy, and Cassie, as well as Gilbert, were axing Trask and Mike, as there is no need for them. Same for Jay and Ice, as much as I love those goobers, we don't need them. And unfortunately, Billy as well. To some point, I want to bring Billy back in some capacity, but in the prologue, not modern times. We open in 1600 Salem, where we find ourselves on the Sanderson Cottage property late at night. We pan up on a window and see Sarah Sanderson sneaking out of that window with a rather clumsy fall for, you know, that's very in character for her. As she scrambles back to her feet, she makes a break for the woods and we cut to Salem Village. She runs in the door of a house and into the arms of Billy Butcherson. The pair embrace and share some words of affection before talking about their relationship. Wedding promises are part of this conversation. As they settle in for a little hanky-panky to keep our PG-13 rating the way we want it, we cut away to the outdoors where we find Winifred Sanderson lurking in the shadows. In her hand is a vial of poison, a needle, and thread. We get to see the fabled scene of Billy's demise, minus the demise part, because, you know, kid-friendly, <laughs> kid-friendly, gotta keep a PG-13, we can't, can't show her actually <laughs> him, we can't do that. After Sarah leaves, Winnie goes inside, and we cut back to the cottage. Sarah is dreaming of marriage, and then Winifred comes home, breaking the bad news. We witness a big fight, during which Winifred blurts out that Mother Witch told her to do it, in a vision for her sake, for Sarah's sake, and for Mary's sake. At first, Sarah doesn't believe her, but Winifred assures her she had that vision from Mother about the situation, and Billy was going to betray the three of them once he got Sarah where he wanted her. After hearing it was a vision sent from their mentor, Sarah believes Winifred, but she is clearly harboring doubt, considering Winnie's sordid past with Billy. We, the viewers, are also not sure if she is telling the truth, even when Mary asks her about it after trying to console Sarah. Winifred promises Mary she's telling the truth, and Mary, of course, believes her fully. We pan out of the cottage and up to the sky, where we see a red-winged blackbird flying towards the screen, and title card. Here's where we follow some of the same beats as I previously laid out in my Avengers storyline, so I'm gonna just go over these really quickly. Becca, Izzy, and Cassie are now witches working on their powers. Danny's a teacher at their school. She doesn't like what they're doing and warns them to stop. Mother has infiltrated Becca's life as Luann as her new stepmother. Becca figures out who she is. Mother steals book back after revealing she needs his locator spell to find an ancient altar with untapped magic underneath. They seek Danny's help. She brings in Max and Allison, who are now married with kids. The new kids don't exactly think she'll come through for them, so they bring back the Sanderson sisters since Winifred owes them one. Everyone meets up in the magic shop, giving us the Spider-Man meme between the Sandersons and the 90s trio. The group formulates a plan to take out Mother Witch with the use of Gilbert's replica spellbook, but instead of a power drain potion, like I said, we're actually going to take a little inspiration from the spellbook I did a review on, which you can watch that review by clicking on this thing right here. It was probably one of the better videos I've done in a while. The spell to drain a witch of her magic involves the creation of an emerald flame candle in the book, and I think it would be very poetic with the black flame candle. They find the list of ingredients for the candle, then a ruckus kicks up outside. They send the Sandersons out there to check it out because the six heroes plus Gilbert believe, you know, they're the most expendable people on their team. 
here's where my idea kind of starts to diverge from the other one. While the witches have a second, Mary and Sarah question what they're doing. Why are they helping these people? Why are they helping these kids? And adults that they once terrorized when they were kids. Winifred tells them there is a separate candle spell that is a sapphire flame candle to empower a witch and this is what they're really searching for ingredients to make. But this time, instead of everything being a little honky-dory with the Sanderson sisters as a unit, and them not meeting up with Mother Witch until the third act, she was the ruckus outside, and she confronts them right there. She overheard them planning the coup from the roof in bird form, which Winifred denies and tells her the real plan is to construct the sapphire candle to empower her. Mother Witch accuses her of lying, which she again denies, but Mother presses the point and brings up how she lied about why she killed Billy. Winifred protests, saying that she had that vision from her, telling her to do it. But Mother denies this accusation, reiterating that Winnie used her as a scapegoat for her own jealousy. Mother tells Mary and Sarah what really happened that night and asks her again to tell the truth. Winifred turns to Sarah, who is looking increasingly despondent, and she swears to their master that she did not kill Billy out of jealousy and she doesn't know why Mother is suddenly turning on her. Mary is on Winifred's side, as it would be. It don't matter what's going on. You know Mary's going to be on Winnie's side. She's her ride or die. <laughs> she is her ride or die. She's a little shocked, <laughs> but she won't step away from Winifred when she's clearly hurting. And then Sarah steps away from Winifred and stands beside Mother. She admits she never believed Winifred and hoped she would prove her wrong. And she thought after Winifred gave up her life for her and Mary, she could believe her. But she couldn't. She had no intention of betraying Mother like Winifred planned to. But again, Winifred swears she had no intention of doing this. Sarah promises Mother that she had looked over the recipe for the sapphire flame candle and she had it memorized. Which, that is not far from the truth, because she remembers a lot of things that the other two don't seem to remember. Oil a boil, and a dead man's nose. <laughs> dead man's toes! Mother takes Sarah away with her to work on a plan to enslave the people of Salem, with the use of that ancient altar and the untapped magic below it, leaving Mary and Winifred in shock. Mary asks Winifred to tell her the truth about Billy and the plan for the candle, and Winifred assures her she was not lying about either situation. But now, her plans were changing to really create the Emerald Flame Candle. If Mother wanted to split their family up with her lies, she'd take matters into her own hands. She sees revenge, baby, and you know she gets focused on that! The two remaining Sandersons meet back up with the kids and former kids who are now adults, and Becca asks where Sarah is, and Mary tells them what happened. Max loses his temper immediately when he finds out they were about to be double-crossed, until Winifred tells him the plan has changed. She now has a personal vendetta against Mother for sullying her good name, at which all six of the others, plus Gilbert, obviously, snort at, and even Mary laughs under her breath before recovering and hiding it from Winnie, who glares at her. Winifred shows them the recipe for the emerald flame candle and the nine people split into teams. Old trio, new trio, Winnie with Mary and Gilbert. <laughs> Each group has one ingredient they must seek out. Now, while the three groups are out looking for their pieces of the candle, Mother is training Sarah to give her a hand in taking over Salem, and Sarah's taking to it very well, showing how much potential she had from the get-go. She's very glad that Sarah jumped ship, and her vocal magic is now on her side. Their goal is to find that ancient altar in Salem that was hidden away from the naked eye, and it will empower Mother to execute a hypnosis spell on the entire town. She keeps bringing up all the bad things Winifred ever did to Sarah to keep that anger up and have her laser focused on their goal. Sarah is all for her plan since she gets to assist with her magic and be up front for once. This leads us to a fun dueling duet between Mother and Sarah versus Winifred and Mary in their own respective areas, obviously. So we will get a song that includes all four witches. 
Don't know what song. Haven't given that part a lot of thought. But here's a joke suggestion for you. How about it's going down from Descendants 2? I don't know. Just something of that caliber. It's got to be a powerful dueling duet song. So, as the crew is searching for their ingredients, Mother has been using Book, against his will, to cause some havoc as well as hunt for the altar. Decorations coming to life. Bewitchments trapping people in costumes, and some creatures of the night running amuck, amuck, amuck. This will let us see Becca's coven demonstrate their powers and give us that cut storyline of Danny Dennison, Doomsday Prepper. Yeah, baby, we're going to her tool shed. We're going to see what her tool shed looks like. She's going to start flipping tables. All the weapons are going to be laid out, and it's going to be. Awesome! She loads everyone up with anti-magic weapons to fight the creatures and free the imprisoned costumed people. It's like a fun little magical war with our old friends and our new friends. The creatures and other hordes just happen to be protecting the ingredients of the Emerald Flame Candle. They manage to fight their way through and retrieve their pieces. But difficulties present themselves for Winifred's team. Gilbert is lured into a dark shop by an enchantment. The thing guarding their ingredient is Sarah, which leads to a confrontation between her and Winifred with Mary trying to quell the situation. Sarah tells them not only are they making a sapphire candle to boost their powers in order to find the hidden altar, they were also making an emerald candle to take care of the new witches and the two of them. It ends with Winifred backing down from hurting her little sister at Mary's request, Sarah taking the ingredient and taking Gilbert along with her, leaving the good guys one team member down. Winifred yells at Mary because they let Sarah get away with their ingredient, and Mary yells back that Sarah never would have done that had she been treated better. Winifred is shocked when Mary raises her voice back and is struck speechless when Mary confesses that she is sick and tired of running interference between the two of them. She's tired of being in the middle of all of their silliness. She needs a break. She wants this over. She asks Winifred again to tell her what happened with Billy Butcherson. And Winifred again tells the story of the vision. She swears this is what happened. She was told in that vision by Mother that Billy was going to expose them as witches after taking advantage of Sarah to get back at Winifred for kissing him as a boy. She did it to protect her family, not because she was jealous, although it did feel good to get back at him for dumping her. She had known about his and Sarah's affair for a long time, but she couldn't bring herself to hurt Sarah in that manner. She did resent her for taking Billy, but she didn't resent her enough to break them apart. She loved Sarah, and she was kind of happy to see her happy. It made her think her younger sisters might have a chance to have better lives than what she could offer them. She blamed herself for their banishment, their association with the dark arts, and everything bad that ever happened to them and every bad thing they ever did. Mary sits down with her, comforts her, and says they are not giving up yet. Maybe this was their chance to turn things around. So even if they can't make the candle, they'd regroup with the others and come up with another plan to defeat Mother. Mary is now beginning to have her own suspicions about Mother's motives with Sarah. She believed Winifred not because of what she said, but how she said it. Something had to be done before it was too late. Unfortunately, once everybody meets back up, things don't go very well. Danny blames them for the loss of the ingredient, claiming they let Sarah go to help their foe. Becca tries to defend them, but Izzy and Cassie don't buy it since Gilbert was taken prisoner. Everyone is turning on Winifred and Mary until Mary steps up and gives them the lowdown on their internal situation. She has a theory that Mother has been playing them against each other from the start because Sarah was vulnerable. She was the one Mother planned to kill when they originally met. She also also knew about Winnie's short temper and how Sarah tended to get on her nerves. Izzy asks her why she wasn't being manipulated and Mary says she's not that easily broken and everybody gives her a look including Winifred. Anyway, she has a plan that they can all come together and use Danny's anti-magic 
and the new kids' magic and their powers to take down Mother without the candle. It was gonna be a battle royale between the eight of them and the other two. Meanwhile, Sarah and Mother have located the altar buried underneath Old Burial Hill. What better place to hide that altar than under hallowed ground? Witches can't set foot on hallowed ground. So that's the perfect place to put an altar like that. She and Sarah have to fly so they don't get touched by that hallowed ground. Sarah lights the sapphire candle and their strength increases enough to break through the power of the seal on the altar and it surfaces. A giant crystal cauldron spilling over with magical energy that has never been touched. There is a huge beam of light, and in come the heroes with Winifred and Mary on their own brooms because hallowed ground exists. Danny, Max, and Allison are locked and loaded to the nines with anti-magic weapons, while Becca, Izzy, and Cassie fire up their own spells to fight. Mother moves into the magical beam and starts absorbing the power, claiming it's too late for the kids and the adults and the other two witches to stop her. She has Seraph do the fighting against Mary and Winifred, which actually proves to be a little difficult on the two of them since Winnie had the better magic of the pair Sarah is currently linked to the sapphire candle and it's their sister they don't want to hurt her Mary takes a pass above mother and through the magic beam as quick as possible to give herself a little power boost so she starts getting her little finger uh, lasers again, which was so much fun and too. I want to bring it back. She does this as quickly as possible while Mother defends herself against the six plucky heroes down below. Their anti-magic and weak spells are no match for her, and she finally absorbs all the magic from the altar. She declares that all of Salem will bend to her will and she'll banish every human descendant of those who wronged her into the netherworld. As she starts to execute the spell, it puts the six down below under her power and they fall down. Winifred and Mary start to feel the effects a little bit, but they're able to fight it off when Sarah pulls out the emerald flame candle from her cloak. Mother tells her to use it and steal their magic so she can have revenge on the one who wronged her. Sarah says she intends to do exactly that, lights the candle, and turns it on Mother. She executes the spell flawlessly and Mother is shell-shocked as she starts to feel her powers draining into the candle. She accuses Sarah of betraying her, but Sarah fires back, saying she never once believed what Mother had told her. At least not after how hard she was pressing the points with her during their partnership. Mother just kept dwelling on it. And the story kind of changed a little bit every time she brought it up. So Sarah picked up on the pattern. She got the idea of using the emerald flame candle when Mother kept accusing Winifred of being dishonest. And her story didn't line up every single time. But Winnie's story never changed once. She asks for the truth. And Mother confesses she did send Winifred the vision in order to keep the three of them from turning back to the light. They'd already done so many terrible things they could never make up for, so why should they even try? She never cared about them being exposed, but she did care that the wielders of her spellbook might die before they helped her find the altar. They were just pawns for her to use so she could eventually find it. But she had the book, she had the power, and she gave them the lives they got so comfortable with so they owed her their lives. She'd witnessed Winifred's selfless act of giving her life for Sarah and Mary, and she was disgusted with this. She'd worked so hard to make them evil, and love ruined all of her hard work. She orders them to destroy the emerald flame candle, and all would be forgiven. The Sanderson sisters had been manipulated, but now they held the upper hand. At least until Mother crushes the sapphire candle, snuffing out the flame. Sarah starts to weaken until Mary and Winifred fly up next to her, place one hand on her shoulders and the other hand on her hands holding the candle. They use their power to increase hers and the power of their bond overpowers Mother because friendship and love and sisterhood draining her magic into the candle and she falls to the hallowed ground 
turning to stone just like somebody else did in the first movie. And since the spell was taken off the town now, the six below use their weapons and powers to destroy her. Becca reclaims a very exhausted book, and they are happily reunited. Winifred and Mary turn to Sarah and ask her how in the world she managed to pull this off. Sarah knew Mother would use her because of all the conflict, and she would be the best one to get close enough to do it. She could use her flaws that Mother saw to her advantage to get close. Mary and Winifred are just stunned and... Winifred can't help but say, that was a very, very, very clever idea. She compliments Sarah for, like, the first time, and it just, Mary is elated that this worked out for all of them. Sarah always believed Winifred because Winifred was easily manipulated by other people, namely, Mother. Gilbert comes running into the area after Sarah's enchantment wore off. She'd stashed him somewhere safe till it blew over. He was disappointed that he missed the big fight again, but he was grateful that he didn't die. The Sanderson sisters hug mid-air as the sun begins to rise. They look down at the seven people below, and everyone looks back. Max apologizes for all the stuff he said about them, to them and the things he said when they weren't around. <laughs> Allison thanks them for stopping the destruction of Salem. Danny thanks them too and admits that she's always been fascinated with their history even though they tried to kill her. Cassie and Izzy say some nice parting words as well and Becca tells them she knew there was always some good in them ever since that Halloween Winifred gave her life for her sisters. Gilbert is a sobbing mess because his heroes that he looked up to his entire life were finally heroes. And as the sun rises, they bid farewell to their allies and prepare to return to the afterlife. But they don't. Their selfless act of saving Salem turned their souls back to the light, and they're given a second chance to make things right. Now, we fast forward to an epilogue where they are back living in the cottage, but they've converted it into a magic school for blossoming witches and wizards, the Sanderson Academy of Magic. Sarah teaches enchantments. Mary gives them lessons on flying on many a different device, should the fancy strike them. And Winifred teaches potion lessons. Gilbert is still running his souvenirs out of the cottage, and he couldn't be happier working with the three ladies he's looked up to his entire life. Becca, Izzy, and Cassie help around the place when they aren't busy with homework or school, and they get a couple magic lessons on the side for free. And Max and his wife, Allison, bring their magical daughter to have some lessons. Danny is a teacher there, too. She teaches young witches and wizards how to defend themselves from the dark arts through lessons on anti-magic. As lessons end for the day, the Sanderson sisters wave their charges off from the front steps of their cottage with bright smiles and we see the book that opened in 1993, Hocus Pocus, close on their story. And then, in the post credit scene, we, it is Halloween night, and the Sanderson sisters are performing at the Salem Scarefest, and they sing, I put a spell on you to send us off into the sunset. There you go, gang! That's my other story idea for how Hocus Pocus 3 could work in tandem with the continuity of the other two films. Sarah gets to reach her potential, Mary steps up and takes charge, we see more of Winifred being vulnerable, which I really, really loved from 2, and I want to see that character growth continue, and we get all of our returning characters, plus, I had to work in Doomsday Danny, dang it, I had to do it! <laughs> what do you guys think? Would this make a good concluding chapter of the franchise? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't, it's free. It helps me, and what helps me helps you guys get more great content like this. Thursday night, I'm back on Twitch with more of Fourth Plays Hogwarts Legacy. This is a Twitch exclusive broadcast, so follow me on Twitch and join in the fun at 7:30 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8:30 p.m. Eastern Time. There is no Black Flame Gaming on Saturday here on YouTube because 
Sunday, April 14th at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and thanks to time shenanigans, 9 p.m. UK Time, it is the Hocus Pocus Bean Boozled Birthday Bash for yours truly. We're going to celebrate my birthday. You guys get to screw me over with all of your Hocus Pocus trivia quizzes, and I'm probably going to have to eat a bunch of nasty beans, and I'm scared, but it'll be fine! Um... That said, you guys have till Friday of this week to finish sending in your trivia to the Discord and sending your fan mail to my fan mail address that you want opened on the stream. I really, really hope a lot of you tune in for my birthday stream. I'll be dressed up as Cassandra Sanderson for it. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you're a regular on the channel, please remember to drop a like and share your thoughts on this story idea down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Casey Zogelman, a.k.a. the fourth Sanderson sister, and I'll see you witches and wizards later. I put a pen on you.